the far post. Dixon. Allen. Allen! Well, this is becoming a habit. In his short Chelsea career, he's now arrived as a substitute twice. Twice in the nick of time. Dennis Wise with such skill on the right. Elliot headed it back purposefully. Dixon made a nuisance of himself. Allen kept going. Hello Chelsea supporters, here at the Blue Day podcast I am delighted to introduce this guest on the show today. He made 18 appearances for the club scoring three. 21. 21 appearances, I've got two grand a game. Scoring three goals, this is going to be a fun one folks. Plus he played with the likes of Dennis Wise, Kevin Hitchcock and Steve Clark. Here is Joe Allen. Joe, welcome to the show. How are you? Hiya my friend, I am, I'm all good. Um, you know, we've, we've been good, we've been bad, but at the end of the day, playing for that fantastic football club um, was one of the best achievements that I ever made in my me, me career. And uh, the day I got told I was signing for Chelsea, um, Don Howe was uh, number two at the time with Ian Porterfield. And he went, oh, you signed for Chelsea? And I went, yeah. He says, get a plane. Newcastle Airport, I paid for the ticket. The chairman, Mr. Ken Bates, one of the greatest people I've ever met in my life. And he went, I'll give you three hours. Get your backside down here. Uh, you signed for Chelsea. And that was like one of the best things. I think I scored, I think, 30, 35 in that season uh, playing at Hartlepool after I left uh, Newcastle. And he went, get your backside on the plane. I'll pick you up at the airport. So when I got to Heathrow, um, Newcastle flight was 45 minutes. And he was there in his Rolls Royce. And I went, hmm. He went, phone your dad. And, and I rang my father. And he went, are you all right, son? I went, Dad, yeah, Frank. I says, I'm I'm great. He went, well, are you okay? I went, I, I says, tell me mother to buy that carpet and the new set E for the house because we've just won the pools. I've just signed for Chelsea Football Club. And he went, great. Proud of you, son. Fantastic. What a story. This is going to be a very interesting one, folks. If you've not heard of Joe Allen, you will by the end of this interview. I guarantee you that. Joe, before we sort of discuss about your time at the Chelsea, we'll talk about the early part of your footballing journey yeah. and talk about your influences on you know who or what for you to become a, a professional footballer and who were your idols growing up as a kid. So um, I went to my careers officer. I was... Uh, 14 years of age, and the careers officer said, um, what do you want to do when you, you get older? What what uh, job do you want, you know, uh, vocation? What vocation? And I went, well, I want to be a pitman like my father. My father was one of 14. He worked on the pit when he was 15 years of age, and he lost his father when he was three. And I just went, I want to be like him. I want to follow him. And on my careers form, my father put, over my dead body, will you go down that hell hole, the mine, that we got brought up on? And I went, well, and then the careers officer said, well, your dad says you can't go down the pit after after the mine. You can't go down the pit. Your father says no. And I went, well, 
he went, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'll be a professional footballer. And he went, Mr. Ferguson turned round, bless him. Uh, God rest his soul. He, he turned round, he went, one in a million from this area became a professional footballer. And I said, well, I'll be that one in the million. And I did when I made my debut for Newcastle United as a 17-year-old playing the number nine shirt at St. James's Park, which is one of my greatest achievements. Mm -hmm. Fast forward a little bit to the summer of 91 when you, you already discussed about your move to Chelsea, but how did the initial contact come about? Was Did you hear anything through... Hartlepool at the time because Chelsea paid, from what I can gather, between two hundred and fifty and three hundred thousand for you. Keep keep it down that, but uh, it was five hundred grand. But didn't worry about it because uh, uh, it managed to pay for the house for a few years. Well, uh, that was the official bid. Yeah. So uh, uh, any extras, that's fine. But uh, how how did the initial move come about um, for you? I, I think uh, the people at Chelsea had watched us when I was playing for Hartlepool because I was like boy wonder at Newcastle with the likes of Gascoigne, Beasley and Waddle, like a young player coming through from the streets, from Council Estate and Gated and Washington, where I live. Um, and it, w it was a case of uh, I got one phone call from Mr Don Ow. And he went, all right, get on the plane now. They'd watched us, I think, about 30 times and I'd scored 35 in 46 games. And you had a prolific season that season, didn't you? Well, it was, it was the fact, that the, the, the best thing about it was, it was the season before when we were second bottom and I, I'd signed on loan from Swansea. I loved Swansea. They were great. But when I went to Hartlepool, you couldn't get any worse than being second bottom apart from being bottom. <laughs> and the manager said, uh, don't worry. He says, we've got to beat 6-0, 6-1 uh, and 8-1 in the first three games when I was on loan. He says, don't worry. He says, in, in six months' time, he says, you'll be the best player in this division and I'll get you a move to a top flight club. And I just said, Gaffer, Mr. Bob Monker, a legend at Newcastle, I said, where are you getting your drugs from? I did, I mean, it's just like, and he went, trust us, you'll do okay. And then I got me moved to Chelsea, but the people and the lovely family of Hartlepool, without them, I wouldn't have gotten there. Ian Porterfield was the manager at the time. What was he like to you as a coach and as a man? Well, he just turned around us and he went, you're signing for... Sun, uh, you're signing for he was obviously 1973 FA Cup winner, a uh, legend, scored the winner in the FA Cup final against Leeds United. And he went, you come to sign for Chelsea? And I went, <laughs> I went, all right, great. But then the guru was the chairman who one of the closest friends I've ever had. We lived about uh, two streets away. I mean, his street was a lot longer than what my street was. I lived in a two-bedroom, semi-detached, and he lived on a farm. <laughs> and Mr. Ken Bates was uh, one of the loveliest, best places. And he went, the day that I, I signed for Chelsea, he went, get your, get your dad and your mother on the phone now. Get them now. And I went, Gaffer, I said, we've only got a like a house phone. He went, just tell him you've won the pools. And he gave me, he said, what do you want? I went, oh, Gaffer, I'm, Jesus Christ, oh, I'm on 400 quid a week at, at Hartlepool. He says, just give us what you, he went. You're the only player that's ever said that to me. So let's start off by being like this. And I went, okay. You want to give me a £75,000 to sign? I went seventy-five grand. My mum and dad's house cost eight grand, <laughs> And it was like the best opportunity. And he went, you'll never let me down because what you are, you're, you're northern. You're obviously, because he was from Wigan. 
believe it or not, he around that area, but it was Ken Bates. And he was absolute legend. And he just said, you'll never let me down. When I scored on my debut for Chelsea, um, he was the first one to come into the dressing room and he grabbed us and he went, that's why I bought you. It was fantastic. Do you remember your first day at training? So well, after you've signed and once all the paperwork's gone through, yeah. you meet up with your, with your new teammates. Do you have any stories of that particular time? So when I got the, I got told of uh, Gwyn Williams, who was a fantastic person, still is. Um, and Gwyn said, you've got a plane ticket from Newcastle Airport going to Heathrow. He says, it's six o'clock the flight. He went, make sure you're on it. Went down. I didn't even have my own football boots. And I played in a practice game where Jukebox Jury, uh, Kerry Dixon and Dennis. And I scored six in a, like a, a small-sided game. By that afternoon, I'd signed for Chelsea Football Club. It was uh, an emotional thing at the Hollington. Um... Ah, God, it was right near the airport. So, right, yes. yeah. so I, I got there and I'm like, mm. I didn't even have my own boots. Oh, uh, God. I was that poor. I was looking, at, honestly, I was looking for the the bishop or the, or the the priest that they used to have at Chelsea all the time. They bless us. And I got blessed because that afternoon I signed for the Chelsea Football Club, which obviously I'm Newcastle. And I love Newcastle, and I'll always love Newcastle. But Chelsea Football Club were fantastic for me. You know, it was brilliant. Now you made your debut for Chelsea against Wimbledon at Stamford Bridge, for which you scored the equalising goal. Yeah. Firstly, when did you know you'd be in the team, and how did it feel for you when you scored on your debut? And do you, and do you remember it well? It's br- it's a brilliant question because. I played, I'd signed for the club, uh, like on trial sort of thing, and I scored a couple of goals against Farnborough, which was in a, a reserve fixture, mm-hmm. and uh, the manager said, uh, be careful what you're doing, and back in them days, there was two subs on the bench, and I was number 14, and he went, you're playing, you're like involved, and I went, hmm, all right, good stuff. And when when he put us on, uh, Mr. Porterfield and Don Howe, um, he just went, enjoy yourself. And I scored, and it was like a dream come true. And I think they're still chasing us down the Fulham Road, because after the goal, <laughs> after the goal and apparently everybody said I handballed it, but I, I definitely did. <laughs> And uh, they ran, they ran down the Fulham Road, and uh, it was like the most amazing football club, uh, Chelsea Football Club, unbelievable. Because Stamford Bridge back then is completely different to what it is now. But in terms of when you was playing, what was the atmosphere like? And you know, with you getting a couple of goals early in your time at Chelsea, that must have given you a nice rapport with the supporters. So. Round the corner from the uh, Stamford Bridge, there was a, a social club, and the lads took us into the social club, and I'd scored on my debut. Uh, basically, it was a dream come true. But I'm in the social club, which is my network, the way I was brought up, and I'm sitting in the social club, and I'm thinking, God, I might just pull here. There was birds everywhere, and I was like, Wow, Jesus. Not too bad for an ugly boy from Gated, but the best thing about uh, the people at the bridge um, was that they were fervently passionate and helpful in any way. They were fantastic to to me and given us like blessings. You know, I'm 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 a Catholic boy, but at the end of the day, you can't understand the passion and the love that I got from them people and the crowd. And if you've scored in front of the shed, 
it's pretty much like nearly like St James's Park, but just nearly. But I'll obviously I'll be forever grateful to have scored at St James's Park and also scored at Stamford Bridge. You know, because you also scored against Notts County earlier on in your time at Chelsea. But the team itself was stuttering; they weren't getting results to climb them up the league. <laughs> Was you surprised with Chelsea's start to that season? Well, the fact is it was only an overhead kick uh, and everybody thought I was like, you know, like red rum, which is murder, the great horse. Um, But I scored an overhead kick against Notts County and um, I think it was uh, one second goal I I think I scored in two or three games, you know. And... um, Obviously, my first one was a fluke, but the overhead kick wasn't. And they're still saying now about how the hell... Well, I must have been good because I put my back out for about three weeks. And it was... Oh, God. Jesus. It was... No, it was fantastic. Uh, fantastic time. I just remember Vinny coming up and patting us on the head um, when he signed, he signed for the club after the Nuts County game. And he went... I saw your goal, you were on the Saint and Greavesy, or on the ball, whatever it was called. I think it was the Saint, the Saint and Greavesy win. I just saw you overhead kick. He says, I said, well, I don't know how I'd done it, but I put me back out. You mentioned Vinnie Jones. You ended up having a good friendship with him on and off the pitch while at Chelsea, and even to this day. What was he like as a footballer for you and as a friend off the pitch he was a hero a hero for me um we went through lots of things together um it's it, it's the one where uh, like uh you know meeting his missus tanya god rest her soul and together we <laughs> were good we were bad but we we're always box office <laughs> we could fight the crack of dawn i swear to you not a problem, and he was like a, a fantastic. Um, you say people think Vinnie Jones, ah, he's this, he's that, and he's other, he's hard case, lock stock, and too small. He used to make me eat properly. We always had the best clothes, we always were together, and never had one bad word. Not one bad word. That was Vincent Peter Jones. Was you surprised in your early time at Chelsea that you weren't starting games with them? As you say, you, you know, you've come in with a big price tag. The chairman obviously likes you, but you weren't starting games. Well, was you surprised at this point? Was you having conversations with Ian about your lack of starts for Chelsea? I was, I was very disappointed because at the end of the day, I thought at my age, then I think I was 24, something like that, and I'd... I'd done my apprenticeship as being a kid at, at Newcastle and I'd played with like I say that the likes of Beardsley, Peter Beardsley, Paul Gascoigne, Chris Waddle, you know, I was blessed. And the gaffer, Jack Charlton, was probably the biggest influence I ever had in my career because he gave me the start in the number nine shirt, which people can only dream about from my area to score and play for Newcastle United and listening to him saying to us, you did all right today. It was great. You like that. Right, you're going to get a game. You're going to play. You're playing for us, the big team. And he was just such a a very... God, I mean, I love my father as everybody does, but... When he gave me the number nine shirt to play for Newcastle United at St James's Park, if I'd finished after one minute, all my dreams came true the day that I put the number nine shirt on and scored for Newcastle United at St James's Park. Fantastic. One game I did want to bring up with you, Joe, was a League Cup tie against Tranmere. You was brought on. To, I'm assuming to obviously win the match to try and get the goal needed. Yeah, but due to a sending off, 
you would then get subbed. What was going through your mind at that point? Well, it... I, whacked, I whacked the centre half, and I can remember him. He was a good player, but I got 14 stitches in the back of my head. He, he nutted at us, but it wasn't the Tranmere centre half. It was actually Paul Elliott, who went up, and Jamaica was like the best centre half I probably ever played with. Paul Elliott was unreal. We call him Jamaica because that's where he's from. No disrespect. But he went up for the high ball and whacked us in the back of my head and I got 14 stitches. Then I come on, the, the stitches at half time, and I ran back on, but I was playing for them then. I was playing for Tranmere. They were going, you, you playing that way? And I went, concussion. I was in uh, I was in Alder, Alder near hospital um, where Wayne Rooney, um, Alder near, I think, something like that. Um, I was in there for two and a half years. And Chelsea were the best as regarding my care, looking after us, top professional people. And But I had 14 stitches on the back. I mean, not bad people think that's a ball spot, but it's not. It was a good spot because... Apparently I'd scored. I, I, I thought I did anyway. Because <laughs> it was Damien Matthews who got sent off and we would then lose 3-1 in, in the League Second, Cup. Yeah. Second game, no. It was two, two legs, was it? Two legs? Yes, it was, yes. Yeah, the first leg was at Stamford Bridge where we drew 1-1. Yeah. One, one. One yeah. And then the, the return tie at Trenton, 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 Trenton Park. Park. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And then we'd, we'd go... Demo, what I, I'll tell you what, talk about underrated players and now like Dennis was obviously one of me me best friends in the world, but a, a heck of a player. What a player. The rat. Right? It, it, he was like he was so good, you know, diminutive. And then I've got him, I've got Vinnie Jones, I've got Townsend, and I've got Kerry Dixon. Then we well, had a Buy a thug or two. Mick Harford. Jesus. Mick Harford. What a player. Hard as goat's knees. I swear to you, I've never seen anything like him in my life. We played against uh, Sheffield United. And um, there, was a, there was a guy, I'm not going to mention his name, but um, it was called Brian Gill. Anyway, and he, and he whacked Mick off the ball because that was what happened in the days when I played. And I'm coming on as sub for Mick Harford. And he went, go. He's North East lad. Mm. He went, go. Get his number. Get his name. So I did. And he was called Brian Gill. We played on January, one of the first weeks in January after New Year. And, um, I'm looking, and Dennis scored after about a minute. Why has he scored after a minute? Hell of a goal. Bramall Lane. What? What a goal. I'm bouncing about everywhere, jumping on the backs. All of a sudden, there's like a little bit of a kerfuffle. And in the middle of the pitch, Brian Gill is knocked out flat. And Mick Hoffer turned around and just went, I told you I'd get him. <laughs> so when we celebrating, <laughs> he's just smashed him. Nah, but that's them were the old days. They were good days, you know. <laughs> you won't get away with that now, not with VAR around. But yeah, I can't get away with radar on my VAR. A couple of months later, you would then go out on loan to Port Vale. What was the thinking behind this move? Was this your, your decision or was it the club's decision? Well, I was I was on a quite a few quid, and and but I wasn't getting this start because uh, like jukebox jury, Gordon um, went to Tottenham, and obviously there was there was players coming in, uh, lots of centre forwards, Cascarino and uh, Kev Wilson, great great players, great lads, but Kerry was there as well, the ledge, the wig. He was there, um, and 
basically I wasn't getting. I mean, I, I scored four against Portsmouth in the reserves at Fratton Park for the reserve team, playing with the Damian Matthews, the the Rodders, David Lee, uh, Gareth Hall, um, brilliant young, fantastic players, and I th scored four. I'm thinking, well, if I score four and I'm not getting a game, maybe I've got to move on, you know. I've got to take a step back to go forward again. Yeah. And I love Chelsea Football Club, don't get us wrong. But I had to go to, to Port Vale and there was, there was one guy, that they, uh, his mum and his dad went to every game. And I went on loan at first and it was Robbie Williams. And Robert was, uh, well, he's just a fantastic person. Great entertainer. But, you know, he, he said, take that. So I had a fight with somebody in the tunnel and he went, well, take that, you bastard. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I pushed him down the stairs and the, the Port Vale was like so steep stairs. And I just, and I went, push us, push us. So as I pushed him, I fucking pushed him and he went rattling down the stairs. And I just thought, you know, well, <laughs> you can take the lad out of Gator, but you can't take Gator out of the lad. Yeah. Interesting loan move then. Fast forward to the summer of 92, which would be the inaugural Premier League season. Yeah. You returned to the club from your loan spell. Did you have conversations with Ian during that summer period about your feelings on the situation and about your future at Chelsea? I understand exactly what you're saying. And um, the gaffer, Mr. Portfield, was a legend. But me, me person that I had at the football club was Don Howe. Right. Uh, Don Howe had been at Arsenal for half his life, West Brom before that. He's all right. He likes that, you know. Yam, yam. But the fact about Don was, he used to pick me up from when I lived with Vinny for such a long time. He used to pick us up from the door and he, he used to educate us. And he played with, like, Sir Bobby Robson at Newcastle United. He played from uh, West Bromwich Albion. And they brought they were brought up together, and he went, you're all right, you. You're all right. It was like Alvarez in pit. I couldn't believe it. I was in the car room listening to him. He went, well, you know, <coughs> I thought you did all right. All right, actually. And I was like, oh, it's done. And he was just... Uh, proper gentleman but a top professional he was unbelievable he used to have a pen down the bottom of his sock with names on and I used to think I hope I'm on that I hope I'm on that list and it was the team that he he wanted to progress and, and put us in the first 11 which like, he went you're right you're playing tomorrow. <sighs> yeah. Well, Chelsea Football Club will always be uh, ever so special in, in my life. After a handful of appearances that season, including a 3-3 draw with Sheffield Wednesday, which I believe was the game where Graham Stewart scored that unbelievable solo goal. Do you remember the about that game? Because I believe we were 3-1 down or something along them lines, and then we'd go on to the comeback, which, uh, you know, uh, so meant Bobby, Graham came Bobby on. Picked, Bobby picked the ball up, Bobby Stewart, right, Graham, love, one of the loveliest lads ever, right? I've been blessed with, with Beasley's, the Waddles, and obviously the Gascoigne, who was the best player I've ever played with. But Bobby Stewart picked the ball up on the penalty area in our yeah. half, and then he ran, and I'm shouting, pass the, pass the frickin' barterers. And he went, that way, that way. He danced. He should have been on Strictly Come Dancing, to be fair. <laughs> and he scored probably the, the best individual goal. Like, I, I was just watching and going, Christ, I've been blessed playing with the players I've played with. Graham Stewart, 
what an absolute player. Top goal. Fantastic. Probably one of the best goals I've ever seen, and he never got the credit for it because back in the day, I think the telly wasn't showing the goals, but I saw it live. I saw him actually waltz around like if he was on Strictly Come Dancing now, he's probably going to 10 of what's his name, Len. In fact, we was we was two nil down in that game. Vinnie Jones scored our first goal. Graham scored the equaliser, and then Newton scored our third. But we still uh, finished up three three. But incredible games in the August of ninety two. In November, you would then leave Chelsea permanently to join Brentford. Yeah. Was this move a combination of the fact of the lack of starts? What was said to you? Well, I... Did you speak to Ken Bates about this move as well? Because obviously he was one that was excited for you to come to Chelsea. And what were your thoughts on the situation? He said, as you move him to Brentford. I went, right. I said, I've got a year and a half left on my contract. He went, no, you're actually signing for Brentford, your record signing. I went, gaffer. I went, I've got to get, he went, I'll give you all the money. Don't worry about it. And when I went to Brentford, it was such an inspirational move because... Um, we had some great lads there, but I think I scored uh, about six in the first eight games or something like that, you know. I scored four in one game against Derby County, and we only drew. And they had Marco Gabbiadini and Paul Kitson, and the centre-half called Short, it was a good big unit, but we scored at Griffin Park, and I loved playing for Brentford. The only reason that I didn't like them was because they played in red and white. And I'm black and white, <laughs> but the Hummel strip was exactly the same copy when I've got to tell you now. And I'm so proud for my father and my brothers, the Sunderland supporters, and I was the black and white sheep in the family because I love Newcastle United, you know. And, you, like, remember them days and the Hummel kit and I swear to you, I had some fantastic nights there at Brentford. The uh, Italian, we used to play in the Anglo-Italian Cup. And uh, I was getting spat at. I was getting knocked off the ball. I was getting elbowed in the face. I broke my jaw a couple of weeks beforehand. I got whacked in training. You know, just when, when injuries happen. And... I played, and I scored a hat-trick, and we drew 4-4. Four, four. I went, okay, now, any chance of getting any defenders? <laughs> Jesus. But uh, brilliant times for me there, and um, very proud to have been like the record signing, and Phil Holder bought us, um, just before Stevie Perryman. Yeah. Phil Holder bought us, and uh, I had Chris Hewton, which probably so influential uh, to try and calm me down, you know. Chrissy, Huggy was legend. Simple as that, you know. Now, there was a rumour that I heard through a few people um, that one of the factors that led to your inconsistent form and the fact that you weren't starting so many games for Chelsea was because of your good relationship with one Vincent Jones, who we've mentioned once or twice today, especially off the pitch, with pranks or other uh, factors. Is this accurate or complete BS? No, to be honest, um, me, and, me and him were, like he was, like I say, one of the most influential people in my life. Um you know, he, he he played for Wimbledon in the FA Cup final in '88, and uh, he was magnificent. And he he played against Steve McMahon, Liverpool midfield player, and Vinnie Jones won the FA Cup for Wimbledon that day, because when he hit him, he had a cut on his eye, but he whacked McMahon. McMahon was probably the best England midfielder at the time, and Vinnie went out and he did him smashed them and the other thing about it I've never had one bad word with Vincent Peter Jones 
he was like a father to us. Um, the best thing about him was he said we're being good, we're being bad, but we're always being box office. Now, I want to talk about current matters, and one in particular that I've got as a few people debating whether or not it's a good thing for football or a bad thing for football. So, Joe, just want to sort of get your thoughts on VAR. What's your opinion on it? Well, I, I just think, to to be perfectly honest, that the, the technology that they're doing is far too much. When we played and I was brought up, I mean, God, I'm 42 now. I mean, stop laughing. But uh, we had one person in charge and that was the referee. Now, if he made a mistake, it was down to him making a mistake. But when he was right, we always had respect for the referee. So the one person that controlled it with the, the line linesman, we call, I call it linesman, they call them all sorts of these days. Yeah, yeah. But when he, he was in charge, the one that was in the middle, we had so much respect for the referee. And I think football these days, you know, um, I think it gets complicated, you know. You give one man the job, he's got the whistle. We take a, take a leaf out of the, the rugby players and how brilliant it is, the, the rugby ladies and the rugby lads that have, have done so well for the country. And you listen to the referee... Some of them are ladies that's refereeing, yet everybody on that pitch, they'll always give the respect to the ref. I think that's a good thing. Now, we have to talk about it because it's something that I bring it up on all our interviews. Probably not the good um, time to do it, bearing in mind the date of this interview. But, Joe, thoughts on current Chelsea so far? Not looking good at the moment. Had a, had a few defeats. The performances have been dire. We've had a change of manager as well this season. New ownership as well within this year alone. What's your thoughts on this current day, Chelsea? Chelsea Football Club will always be in the top three in the, the country, our country. Chelsea Football Club, like, obviously, I love Newcastle more than anything, but Chelsea Football Club will always be up there because the difference between other clubs, Chelsea's got class. Jesus Christ, they bought me. <laughs> they must be good. I mean, you can you know, imagine when I'm I'm getting from the me 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 blessed club, Hartlepool United, right? Which I'll never forget. And the love that I've got for Hartlepool, I mean there's not many you can say that they named the street after you, is there? And Hartlepool United, they blessed me by naming the street after us, uh, Joe Allen Close, and I was close, actually. But I just wish that my mother had been alive to see the fact that they honoured me by naming the street after us. And that makes me humble. And I love Hartlepool, and I always will do, you know. What do you make of Graham Potter as the current Chelsea manager? Do you think he's out of his depth, which some people believe, or do you think he should be given the time, at least maybe another six to 12 months at least, to try and sort this mess out? Well, I mean, I never played against him because he was obviously a lot older than me. Um, but at the end of the day, he did a hell of a job at Brighton. And uh, I think he's got massive potential. But I would, I would have given it to probably Gustavo Poyet or Dennis Wise because or Franco because they were very, very important um, people for Chelsea Football Club, you know. Um, and the, the fact that I was at Leeds United with Dennis and Gustavo, Gustavo so immaculate, everything he did was integral to the football club. We were 15 points behind and then we won the first six games and all of a sudden with Dennis and Gus Gussie and 
and the rat right i'm not being funny he was class as well so good but we had the chairman we had ken bates and he got us all together and i was blessed to i mean leeds united i mean i'm not being funny i'll never forgive them when Sunderland beat them in the fa cup final so that was a, it was a one of them but at the end of the day i'm the, this fantastic football club fantastic football club but i was with the rat dennis and gustavo and it was fantastic just finally joe how do you look back on your time at chelsea well i've been good and i've been bad but i've always been box office i mean at the end of the day <laughs> i've done more like than i ever thought in in my life because i was blessed to put the newcastle number nine shirt on and chelsea and Brentford and Port Vale and all them rest of the clubs I can't remember. Well, I was very loyal. That's why I had nine clubs, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the difference is that I would have paid to play football. They paid me. And the supporters, the people that come, they're the most important things. The people that come to watch games, the ones that pay their money, hard-earned cash to watch their team, whoever have it, like I said, lots of clubs, but they paid to watch the match. That's the real, that's the the winner. The real winner is the supporter. Without the supporters, you haven't got a football club. You know, the supporters are the best. That's that's it. Well, Joe. It's taken a long time to interview you, or we've all been, obviously we did different locations in this country, but it's been an absolute pleasure to not only meet you, but to talk to you on all things football. All the, all the best, and hopefully we'll see you down the road real soon. You're a diamond, you're a gentleman, and you're a scholar, but you also will always be my friend, so I appreciate that. Top man, thank you very much.